first of all, thank you very much for coming on here. This is uh, this is amazing. This is something special. Like I said before, this is this is a, a blessing that we can share this time together and share ideas together uh, that in this manner. So thank you guys for coming on here. Really grateful. Yeah, to, pleasure. Yeah, grateful to be. So uh, just I'm gonna get right into this. If somebody were to come up to one of you guys and say, hey, what's this Buddhism thing all about? You know, what's with the robes and the shaved head? And why do you live this lifestyle? And they don't know anything about Buddhism, never heard of the Buddha, never read any of the suttas. They have is a blank slate. How would you explain what Buddhism is and why it's important? Ajahn? Uh, yeah, it's a great question, really common question, because we are kind of flags. I mean, you leave the monastery and you're just like waving this brown flag of I'm doing something different. I'm living my life in a, a different kind of way. So this is a, a very common question. And many people in America, in my experience, most people, especially in California uh, or the, the West Coast, where we both are, um, yeah, p- people are interested for the most part. It, it's exceedingly rare to have any negative uh, interaction. So yeah, people coming to ask, uh, yeah, what is, what is Buddhism? And um, I think a good answer is just, it's a, a way of trying to live a beautiful and good life. And that's vague, but it's also, it's also accurate. Um, if a follow-up question was, well, what does that mean? Um, a accurate response could be, well, it's a, a realistic way of looking at one's life and trying to uh, lead your life in a way which leads away from you creating uh, more suffering and discomfort and uh, unsatisfactoriness for yourself and the people around you. So basically becoming more and more skillful at uh, leading a uh, leading a life which is leading to uh, increasingly um, subtle and profound states of happiness happiness, which are less dependent on, on other people in a, um, yeah, in an, in an unhealthy way. So it's not the most concise answer, but I think it's, it's fairly accurate in terms of the robes. I don't know, Tanisba, do you want to, uh, reflect on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. I'd say that um, the a large part of the whole path is, um, you know, especially the monastic one is one of, you know, affirming something which um, the first verse of the Dhammapada, which is one of the more like seminal texts in the suttas, uh, has a pretty famous. Uh, passage that states the mind is the forerunner of all things suffering follows the untrained mind like the um you know ox we are the wheel of a cart follows the ox hoof um happiness follows the well-trained mind like a shadow that never leaves and as with many of the teachings i think it's easy to overlook the fact you know these sort of hidden um implications of that is that suffering is easy to see its course you can kind of put your hands on it like the ox cart the um, ox hoof where he's shadow you know a shadow and a lasting happiness are very easy to look over and they're subtle so it's kind of the nature of our suffering one of the reasons we hold to it is because it's easy to see and to chew on and i think we all have that experience of you know going again and again to the same argument or fault or negative thought train that we've hashed over for decades um so one of the difficulties of the spiritual path is that you're holding up something that is by its nature more subtle and harder to see and can easily fade into the background if you're not careful to look at it um with sort of a steady and nuanced gaze so you know part of the props and the how um 
almost Baroque uh, our outfits are. Um, that might be the wrong word, but how we're meant to stand out. Um, and the Buddha was not shy about, you know, putting together these very explicit symbols of the path in terms of the monastic Sangha. Um, because what the spiritual path points to is so much more subtle and easy to see. So in a certain way, you need to frame it um, even more uh, carefully and explicitly um, for it to have any chance of being seen in the midst of, you know, a city with advertisements blaring from this way and that way, just to have some, some symbol that counteracts that or speaks to some other path in life. Um, you know, you need that, but because what you're pointing to is harder to intuit than in some ways, this, these robes, which are called the banner of the Arahants in, or the enlightened beings in our Buddhist teaching um, need to be easy to see. Um, so it, you know, when you first step into, you know, robes and then your first time coming back to the West or walking through an airport, it can be pretty, and you know, it, it's, you feel that you stand out, um, but it, it's important that we, you know, eventually become all right with that because even if, you know, 50% of the people think it's a little bit strange, maybe there's one or two who needed to see something yeah. a bit different and needed to see that there's some other path that isn't focused on money. And, you know, these robes imply a lot. We can't touch money. Um, we, you know, we have renounced a lot of those things and none of those things are wrong by their nature, but um, the fact that you're able to live a happy life without them puts them in their place and, you know, helps us remember what the North Star of our lives should be. Mm. What's the North Star? Ajahn Kovilo? What would you say the North Star is? It's interesting. I'm actually in a Buddhist university right now, and uh, we have some non-Buddhist classes. So we have a natural science class. And uh, yeah, I'd actually never actually looked through a telescope at the North Star or really understood what the North Star was in the sky. But <laughs> this is probably most people know this, but all of the star, other stars in the sky seem to be circling around it. So it's the most important thing in, in the solar system from a navigational point of view. And for uh, us as monks, yeah, I, I think you could say that the, the North Star is the Four Noble Truths. That's one way of understanding it. Um, the Four Noble Truths are that the truth that there is unsatisfactoriness in life. There is, yeah, our lives aren't perfect, perfectly happy all the time. Second Noble Truth is that uh, the cause of that unsatisfactoriness, the cause of that suffering is just the inner discontent, inner craving. We just constantly want more. We get a little bit of whatever we think we want. And then, uh, yeah, we're satisfied with that for a little bit, but then we start wanting something else. We're just constantly hungry, um, satisfied for a little bit, and then hungry again um, for sight, sound, smells, taste, touch. And then the third noble truth is that there is a, uh, a cessation. There's an end of that constant unsatisfactoriness. And that is by learning how to not, to not crave and to not, uh, yeah, to give up all unhealthy and um, ultimately unsatisfactory forms of, of wanting. And then that there's a path and that's through training in ethics and uh, training the mind through meditation and training wisdom. Uh, so how that is a North star is that these aren't, these aren't just, you know, four philosophical points of view, which, uh, are abstract. And you think about from time to time, you can really frame all of your experiences through daily life, through each of these, through these lenses, and they all have different ways to interact with them. So when you see suffering in your own life, you don't try to push it away, but you try to understand it. When you see craving in yourself. You don't just try to gratify it, but you try to actually abandon it if it's an unhealthy form of, of craving. And when you have this idea that, oh, actually, I can transcend this craving, you try to realize that. And ultimately, the final realization of that is Nibbana. And how to reach that is the path which you develop. So there's both principles to see your life, to frame your life 
through these different things. Okay, what? And then there are duties. So, okay, I see suffering in myself or in someone else. I can try to understand that rather than push it away, which is a natural human response. So, yeah, it's a it's a pole star. It, it gives you direction in life, and that's that's beautiful, and that's um, something which I feel like will lead you all the way to the goal. That's the that's the plan. Mm. It's like a shining beacon of hope for our own liberation. And and actually to expand that metaphor more, you know, the way you find the North Star is you find the Pleiades, which is sort of the little dipper and they point straight to the North Star. So it's almost like the Four Noble Truths could be a bit of the Pleiades and they always point every time to Nirvana, to cessation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but they're also the North Star because they include within them liberation as well. So I like that, Ajahn. Hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And that's what we all need, right? Some kind of direction. I feel like we're all lacking some kind of just, I guess, maybe purpose, I guess you could say some kind of placement here. We're all, you know, it seems to be like, we're just, we're just grasping at things. Maybe this, maybe that, maybe this. And it's, like you said, it's never this or that, but it's good to know that Buddhism provides us with that. It provides us with a, um, with the path, literally like a path that you can walk for your own liberation so you don't have to go through it anymore you know it's a beautiful thing um yeah how did you come to find this you know how did you uh was there a defining moment in in your lives where you just said you know what i'm done i'm uh, I'm, I'm done with this western lifestyle and i'm i'm following the path nice well um I think there's like moments when we're young, especially where certain inclinations are very apparent in us. You know, you, you sort of see people in your lives who, when they're young, you know, a certain direction is quite clear. And then, you know, you kind of forget and you go to college or whatever, or don't. And then sometimes that comes back and you sort of find your way back, I feel. Um, and when I was 15, I, like many a burgeoning hippie, read Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. And, you know, it's just a beautiful book. Um, not terribly Buddhist in some ways, <laughs> but it's a great book. And um, yeah, that was my first sort of vision of a monk uh, in the vision, you know, in the um, image of the Buddha. And just the idea that a life could be explicitly dedicated in form and function to the complete liberation of the heart, um, which a lay life can be dedicated to as well. But certainly it was very clear in that image of an enlightened being. Um, so when that happened, I started to meditate regularly and it just mm -hmm. became the centerpiece of my life. Like Ajahn Kobilo was saying, the North Star. And um, over the years, uh, by the time I finished college, uh, it was the biggest thing in my life. And at the same time, I'd seen that steady, you know, we, we have a term in Buddhism called Sankara, which is sort of translated as volitional formation. I think in this context, it might be more helpfully translated as program. And it's sort of these programs or personality uh, habits or ruts we get into of perception and action. And you see how over the years, they just pile on top of each other to the point where there comes a day when um, you can hardly feel your life anymore through this kind of crust of programs. Um, and you're running on automatic and the hedonic treadmill has you just sprinting. And by the end of college, I was in that place. Like I was sort of driving down the West Coast, looking into grad schools and listening to, you know, audiobooks and top 40 radio and stopping stopping at Taco Bell and just trying to fill up the gap somehow. And then I stepped to a Bayagiri, which is our uh, a monastery in our lineage in north of San Francisco. And the silence there really struck me. And I, I realized that I needed a container like that if I was going to um, face my suffering and live a life worthy of my death is how I'd put it. Um, so yeah, that was sort of the, the clincher. And then I ran off to Thailand and it's, um, it felt like the first 
giving my life to Buddhism and, and this path in this way felt like the first time I found a stream bed deep enough to hold my whole heart and purpose. Um, before that, it was like, you know, all the stream beds the world had given me in terms of paths of action in life, you know, they're, they were all good, but not enough. And, you know, when that's the case, the heart has no real choice, but to fracture into, you know, a hundred kind of turbulent tributaries of this or that. And this is the first time I found something where it, it was powerful enough to take all of it for me. Mm. I'd be very curious to hear Ajahn Kovilos too. I always like hearing the story. So if Ajahn, if you feel like inclined. Yes. So keeping with that theme of like the four noble truths, um, there's kind of a funny way of conceiving of different people's paths, like how people enter people who weren't born, say in a Buddhist country, or even people who were born in a Buddhist country, but who are just nominally Buddhist until they actually are really inspired. And there's this term of you have firsters and thirdsters and even seconders. So basically this is like someone who enters the Dhamma through the first noble truth, the second noble truth or the third noble truth. So the firsters are the people who just have a lot of suffering and like you're looking around for, for something that's going to, going to heal you, you know, and get rid of all the physical and emotional you know, weight that you're carrying around. And then you have seconders who are maybe people who in a Western context would enter into a 12 step program. You're just, your cravings and your addictions are just totally overwhelming you and totally crushing you again and again and again every day. Um, and then you have thirdsters, maybe like Tanisibo to some extent this, or yeah, you, you have an ideal. You realize maybe there's a way out of this. There's like a more beautiful way of living. Um, and I think for myself, it was some, uh, maybe also a, a thirdster, you know, enter into this 10 day meditation retreat a friend in college, um, when I was 20, introduced me, he said, oh yeah, there are these great 10 day meditation retreats and they're free. And I'm like, okay, sounds, sounds great. That was enough. Um, so go to this 10 day meditation retreat and you're being quiet and sitting meditation for 10 hours a day for 10 days straight and basically just working on one meditation method. And it's just fascinating to one, to see the peaks and valleys that the mind can experience when you're unplugged from other things. Yeah, you volunteer to give up your cell phone and all your different media outlets and typical ways that you distract yourself for, for these 10 days, even like reading. So all, basically your only thing you're relying on is the meditation object and to see you know, how absolutely miserable that can make you feel, um, but also how like, when you're really into the, the particular technique, just the blissful states of mind you can experience. And, uh, and you can see how training the mind, like learning this technique or learning how to direct your mind in certain ways can really have an effect, either leading towards that you know, miserable suffering or leading in a direction of like contented ease. And that can be you know, independent of you know, physical, um, yeah, physical suffering. And I, I just found that life changing because it's a, a way of training the mind, which is so much deeper and more profound than um, the kind of the readings that I was doing in, in university at the time. So. Mm. Where did you come up? Where did you hear that framing of the first years and the second years, Ajahn? That's really good. I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, I don't Did you come up with it? It's I good. don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Some other Buddhist guy or girl, maybe. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, wow. it's good that um, the Dhamma is coming to the West, you know, the being able to that you guys are very articulate with how you speak, you know, I watch your videos and, and your, your speeches and the way that you put things is very um, relatable and very grounded for people to understand. And that is important because, you know, the I, I live near a meditation center. It's uh, Theravada, and I've been there a few times, and I, I listened to a Dhamma talk by this monk, but he's from Thailand, and I can I, I mean this with the utmost respect, I can't really understand what he's saying, and I, I know he means well, but it's just like, I, it's, it's hard, to, literally the message gets lost in translation and what he's trying to say, but when we have people like you guys 
that you know are are um you know native english speakers it's it's a very powerful thing for the dhamma and the spreading it to the west um i don't know where i'm going with that but yeah i'm thankful that you guys are doing your thing because it's it's very important for that um that translation to not get lost uh in translation <laughs> so yeah uh, that's awesome um I'm trying to think where i want to go with this you, I, I mean it's there's a relevant just offshoot into that reflection which is also you know um you know there is this issue of sometimes it's it's hard for that heart of dhamma to get translated into our cultural and linguistic context um and it kind of remains on the other side another issue is when the translation and the articulation of Dhamma is so distant from the taproot in the other culture that you lose the essence as well. Like there's two ways of losing the translation. And I'd say one issue with, you know, so much modern articulation of Dhamma is you do kind of, um, you know, to varying extents, the articulation does kind of swerve away from the sort of beating heart of the, you know, of that ancient wisdom. Um, mm -hmm. which is has been preserved in, in the East. And um, I think that's a danger in the US um, to an extent is, you know, people know what people like to hear and mm -hmm. know to sort of, and teaching tends to veer that way. And, and fair enough, we need to adjust our articulation, but um, there's real value in, in sort of these, um, you know, having a decent finger on, sort of the the teachers who are still around who I think you know many of them are enlightened and you know I think in the west we it's we can sometimes forget that and and that's another way it gets lost in translation somehow yeah mm. yeah it's like bridging the gap yeah mm. we either side of the if you're stuck on either side of the river if there's not a decent bridge it's it's a bit yeah troublesome so. <laughs> well and i think both tanisabo and myself feel similar to you like grateful for for our teachers because well for myself i ordained in america with a canadian monk who ordained in thailand uh, lumpur pasano ajan pasano at Bayagiri monastery who ordained with ajan cha one of the greatest meditation monastery uh masters in in thailand of the uh, 1900s and yeah he's or you know born in america um raised in or sorry born in canada but you know can explain things you know i can ask him any question that i have which largely are coming from you know judeo-christian american values growing up but he lived and trained in thailand for 20 years before starting a Bayagiri. um more than more than 20 years perhaps but um yeah, he can answer all of my questions, which, um, yeah, as you say, like all respect to, um, yet yeah, people from Thailand or Burma who are teaching meditation in, in America. Um, but yeah, there is, there are linguistic barriers and in cultural barriers, you know, it's, if they haven't been living in America, you know, it, <laughs> there are a lot of weird things about the way we think, you know, as Americans and, yeah. um, yeah, we've got, we just have so many questions coming to, to Buddhism uh, new and fresh and uh, to hear answers from people who've wrestled with the same questions and have found ways to reconcile, you know, teachings which on their face or things or traditions or um, customs or ceremonies, which just seem utterly weird, which, you know, if someone is born in a Buddhist country, that's just the water they swim in and they never think about oh, why are we, you know, bowing to this golden Buddha statue? Or why are we chanting for three hours? Or what's up with all this incense and the robes and all these other questions, which as Westerners, we think about for like years. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost, um, yeah, it's, I guess it's a double-edged sword that we are, we, we're, we're not from that culture, but it also makes it a little more interesting that we're not, from that culture, you know, there is that disconnect in terms of language, but there's also that interest 
because it's it's foreign you know it's something that's like oh what is this why do they live like that hmm. um so yeah i guess you it depends on how you look at it and how you want to digest it now what would you say is um how do i frame this what is like what is the what are the pros to live in the monastic life rather than the lay life i asked this to ajahn sani he just said it's easier if you want to attain liberation he said it's just an easier way to go about it would you kind of say it's along those lines hmm That's a good answer. You know, it's simple. Um, and for some personality types, especially, it's, you know, especially helpful. Like uh, in um, some, one way of looking at different personalities in Buddhism is which of our defilements is most prominent. So you have greed, hatred, um, and delusion and it's a overly simple framework but uh for a greed you know I, I have a lot of i'd say greed is maybe my most prominent in of those and um it's just it's difficult to be in this world of uh distraction and seduction and netflix binges and you know all that stuff and not dilute my life um it's not like you know, that loss of purpose isn't usually explicit or um, tragic on its face, but that slow dissolution of, of purpose and the loss of our North Star little by little, year by year, is a tragedy, despite the fact that it happens slowly without us noticing half the time. And I, I just, um, I know that I would have an extremely hard time keeping my eye on what matters if I was, you know, in, in the world, there's so much. Um, and that's to say nothing of what happens when you do, yeah, take on a family. And, um, you know, we usually divide um, beings into five khandas, you know, the focuses of identity of the body feeling. And th these are things you can, um, you know, sort of, we attach to and, you know, when you take on a a spouse and a kid, you're taking on five more and five more and five more. A lawnmower is like an extra one, you know, and I mean, it comes, it's, it, it does take a lot of time to make a living and, and do all that. And I think that if we keep, you know, our practice strong, then you can use those khandas, those aggregates, that identity in the world and experience as a route to liberation, even as a lay person, um, obviously. But it does, you know, you end up juggling a lot of balls and um, it can be difficult to do that and to keep your center enough that you can focus intention towards awakening moment after moment. Um, so, yeah, I think the monastic life is simpler in that way. Um, I don't think everyone's going to be a monastic and that's OK. And, um, you know, but for me personally, I, I do feel like some people just have uh, you know, you feel called to it and you feel more at home in this form than you would in any other. And that was the case for me. So I know for me personally, it, it just felt right in that, in that respect. Um, but I've seen monks who are, you know, not having, you know, haven't fit with the monastic life they found. And um, that hasn't been, uh, you know, that's, that seems hard. So There's something which is uh, just so helpful about living with a group of people who are all like aimed in the same direction and all are trying to, um, yeah, look at the world and their own experience from similar perspectives, similar goals, similar path. And especially like if you're living in a, a small community, all have shared ideals of like not... Uh, glorifying anger. I mean, <laughs> this is, it's such um, a rare community that of, of course, you know, all of us enlightened people uh, still have you know, degrees of coarse and refined uh, anger and frustration and 
annoyedness. Uh, but when you're living in a community that realizes that actually this, this is our own, like my anger is my issue and I shouldn't try to put it on you. And um, of course we still do because we're still deluded as well, but uh, it just makes the path so much friendlier. It, it makes your community and makes uh, life a lot simpler when other people aren't um, labeling you as the problem when people are accepting self-responsibility that my problems are, are my problems largely, especially when you're living in a, a peaceful environment like, like a monastery and where we have shared ideals of, um, yeah, of confession or of asking forgiveness. Um, so that's, those are just some of the, the social elements which just really do make it, make life easier when you're living with other people who are making you the butt of their problem then uh yeah it, it weighs on your heart because if the people are, you care about are um yeah not accepting personal responsibility then um it gets really heavy and it's hard not to take on their view um so yeah just the shared shared view is is really really helpful and really beautiful and uh the friends you have at a monastery are just um wouldn't wouldn't exchange it for anything I, th I think that approach that Ajahn is taking of really pointing out the salient uh, benefits of the monastic life that can be carried into the lay life is, is wise because like what Ajahn, what you're pointing to in terms of living in community. Um, yeah. People have this idea that, you know, us monks go off into huts and just live alone completely. And the monastics I've seen do that by and large are pretty miserable if they do it for a long period, you know, I mean, one of the, beauties of the monastic life is just actually living in community and um it is so helpful you know you have time to practice too but um just you know as as late because because not everyone is not going to be a monastic but there's so many underutilized things threads in the monastic life that the buddha really did um give easy access to for someone living a lay life you know finding a really good sangha and community um spending time at monasteries around people like that whenever you're able i mean any monastery in our tradition will allow you to stay for free for nothing uh, for as long as you know more or less as you want as long as you know you don't burn down something <laughs> um and uh so like using those things um approaching senior teachers i mean you can access a great deal of unbelievably well-practiced monks right now online uh, via Zoom, um, regular YouTube live Q and A's, all those wonderful things. Um, and then utilizing, you know, another great thing that Ajahn Kobilo is referencing about the monastic life is the props and the rituals of asking for forgiveness and confession. And the Buddha gave many of those um, in form to lay people as well in terms of taking a day a week to dedicate to practice. Um, you can, have someone that you ask forgiveness with or confess to every now and again. Um, so I, I think that's a really wise thing to do is just see which, which aspects of the monastic book life can be incorporated. Yes, uh, that's fascinating. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote an essay, he said that the next Buddha would be a Sangha, you know, the Maitreya would be, uh, would be the return is like the, is a community. And I think that's a very interesting way to look at it. It's, it's, and that's kind of what we're doing right now, or what we have the potential to do is create this worldwide Sangha, this worldwide community where we can share these ideas from centuries past and really, you know, walk the path and live the path um, that the Buddha laid out for us. Um, so, you know, maybe he's onto something. It's an interesting, interesting idea. But um, yeah, so you would never go back. There's no... You would never go back to the lay life? Ajahn Kovilo, you take this one first. <laughs> <laughs> There's almost, so in, in different Buddhist countries, they have different um, ethos of how long someone will, will stay in robes or are expected to stay in robes. So in Thailand, it's very common. It's, it's the norm for people to take temporary ordination. And there's no expectation at all in all lineages that I know about that someone would take lifetime vows. In Sri Lanka, it's a very different thing. Like monks, when they do ordain, are somewhat expected to take lifetime vows. I think similar in Bhutan, um, similar in, in Christian traditions. But um, 
And I believe in Chinese Mahayana traditions as well, there are expectations of lifetime vows, but in our Thai tradition, um, yeah, they don't expect that. So we're not asked to, you know, burn incense into our, uh, you know, skulls into our head to mark that we're monastics for life. But, and there's almost a bit of a, a taboo or a superstition, like if I were to make lifetime vows, then that might, you know, make uh, some kind of comic, re you know, repercussion come up. But um, short of saying that I vow to be a monk for the rest of my life, I really want to be a monk for the rest of my life. Um, I think it's a beautiful, a beautiful thing. I have so much gratitude and respect for my teachers who've been monks for, for decades. And yeah, I hope to look after some of those monks. The Western monks who have ordained into the Thai tradition are still, you know, I mean, the oldest one is Lumpur Sumedho, who's living in England at present, and he's, I think, 85. So we actually haven't had, you know, we're still a fairly young tradition. So it's, it's yet to be tested, you know, how well us relatively young monks will look after the aging, aging monks. Um, but I kind of hope that, um, yeah, I'll be able to, you know, stay healthy until I'm older. But regardless, I, I do hope that I can stay in robes for the rest of my life. It's a beautiful path. You're cultivating mental skills, which I feel are, you know, you can only play sports for so long. You can only play basketball until you're a certain age. But these mental skills of training the mind in mindfulness, training concentration exercises, these are things which uh, hopefully can outlast dementia. You know, dementia is a uh, Alzheimer's. These are aspects of the brain, but we do have, yeah, Ajahn Chah apparently had uh, some form of dementia or Alzheimer's. And it said that he was able to have this knowledge, this knowing, which although his brain was um, you know, decompensating, you know, he could, he could see it and know it and not be uh, affected on a very deep level and not suffer from it, even though his brain is decaying. So yeah, I would aspire to something similar. Uh, Tanisima, what are your, what's your take on being in robes for life? I can probably help to help take care of you, Ajahn, if when you get up there in age, although I'll be right about there with you. So <laughs> we can sit on the porch together. Um, yeah, I, I uh, love the idea. And um, it's the form that's felt the most, um, it gets a bit, if you're just thinking about what sort of will be the most, um, you know, where I'll be happiest, then on a broad level, I feel like for me, it, it is the monastic life. But there's also days where, you know, you, you aren't, you know, it would be nice to go out and have dinner. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that a more powerful recollection that is sustaining through those darker periods is really thinking what gift you have to give to the world. Um, that's the most that's the best gift that you personally can give and are equipped to give. And um, I feel like when I think of that question, the answer very clearly is consistently um, my being in robes, just because, um, you know, while there's immense gifts, gifts one can give as a lay person, and, um, you know, for many people that will be the route they give back, um, for me personally, this does feel like my karmic draw. And I do think there's, you know, a real use of having um, samanas, monastics in the world. Um, and uh, I think it's been something strangely lacking from the US uh, ever since, you know, the Reformation in um, Europe, which happened for good reasons, but, you know, it sort of eliminated the Christian monastics from our, you know, the sort of at least being very visible in the US. And I feel like our culture has been grasping for that archetype ever since to replace it. I mean, you look at the sort of spiritual authority we invest in writers, you know, and, and how people will, you know, but Bukowski is not who you want to go to in terms of how to live a good life. You know, mm -hmm. even Tolstoy, who 
was, you know, one of my favorite authors. I mean, he was not, you know, he was a pretty, you know, he was trying to go to a monastery for most of his life and never really managed. Um, but, you know, you see how our culture wants something like that. Because I think there's a place for it in, in, in a culture is something like that. And, um, you know, if I can be, you know, maybe my being in robes can help a little bit with, um, you know, providing some sort of figure like that every now and again, walking down the street or on a Zoom session. So it feels like that's, you know, at least if, if for nothing else than for that, uh, I think being in robes would be a good thing because I think things are going to get hard these next decades. I mean, they're always hard, but things are changing very quickly. And to, I think that the world, you know, it, it needs a sim, it needs a spiritual path to make it through it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you see yourself as the embodiment of that spiritual path. That sounds conceited. Um, so no, but I see <laughs> the, um, and, and I'm a very imperfect embodiment in so many ways. Uh, but if nothing else, the robes um, do point to something which is helpful. And, mm -hmm. you know, at, at least that, like, at least if I'm going on alms round in the morning and someone drives past and sees, you know, the robes and the shaved heads, maybe they think of the Dalai Lama that they've seen sometime on the TV. And, you know, that's a good recollection. So ha having some some signpost in, in society that serves that function seems important. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, I agree. To, to show people this is possible, you know, renouncing not maybe everything, but maybe certain things in our life, it's possible. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Now, would you say Buddhism is almost like preparation for our own suffering, our own death? Um, yeah, that's one way to look at it, which sounds kind of depressing, <laughs> but, um, I think, yeah, I think many philosophers, Buddhist and otherwise have, I think, framed their lives in that, in that way, you know, practice or meditation is practice, practice for death. And, um, I think practice of the, uh, meditation is, is broader than that, but certainly it will, it will help, you know, for when, we do, you know, reach the final years or moments of our life. Um, yeah, being able to to stay lucid, being able to stay uh, with a bright a bright awareness, and you know, in a Buddhist context, there are there there is teachings on on rebirth that the final moment of death is not, you know, the be all and end all of you know experience. Things do go on, and you know, there are these teachings that uh, that is pretty important moment in our life. Um, so yeah, being able to approach that with as much clarity and uh, focus and settledness as possible uh, is a really important thing. But that said, I mean, we still have every single moment that leads up to that, that final moment. And um, that's much more, you don't need any kind of philosophy about what happens after death to realize the importance of all those moments pre-final moment and yeah practice of of meditation helps all those moments i mean just on a mundane level kind of pointing to what Nisip, tanispo is pointing out of uh yeah just um yeah being an embodiment of some kind of spirituality you know just for our our family member or the people in our our small communities uh who want to come and meditate with us you know we can many of them are American don't have any kind of, you know, view about rebirth or anything. And, and honestly, it's on one level, it's not really so important. We're not pressing that or certainly not forcing it for, for anyone who doesn't have a belief in any kind of afterlife or rebirth. Um, but just all the benefits that you can see and are anywhere to, to find on the internet of this present moment, present life benefits of, of training the mind. I mean, yeah, it helps study, it helps your health. Um, and yeah, it's, it's hard for anyone, the most secular person um, to deny these, these benefits of, of, yeah. One of my favorite quotes um, is from uh, Pascal of 
All of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. <laughs> and it's just so true. Like how many, forget humanity, like how many of my problems stem from my inability to just be quiet and be content by myself, you know, just constantly having to, to feed off of my relationships with other people or having to go out and seek all these different pleasures and not being able to just, yeah, no, no contentment, just watching the breath. And this is a skill which you can learn. That's what we're talking about. You know, the, and, and it does, it is a skill and you do become bet You do get better at it. And yeah, there are exceedingly pleasant mental states to be known uh, through, through mind training. So mm. I, um, I don't know, I was reminded of the, I heard, you may have heard this study as well, where they gave people this machine that shocked, you could like press a button and it would shock you and it'd be like, it's quite unpleasant. And then they just put people in a room for like 20 minutes and like, you can't go to sleep. You have to sit there in this room. And after a while, people just started shocking themselves to have something to do. <laughs> it's, it's very damning of our culture. <laughs> so, yeah. That's kind of, that's how the mind works. We just want something, but there's just, it's just grasping at something, even if it's something that's not necessarily pleasurable. We just want to feel something rather than nothing at all. It's the mind, man. It's, it's tricky. <laughs> well, yeah. That's what we need, man. Just to be able to find peace in ourselves. to find, you know, five, 10 minutes a day to just disconnect from all of this craziness and to connect with this peace and it's inside of all of us all of us we all have that peace inside of all of us we just don't know it that's the thing it's like it's like we're almost afraid of our own peace inside which is ironic <laughs> where a lot of people just are very um it's, it seems like a daunting task to be able to do that to just to just sit down for five ten minutes and to just close your eyes and breathe right it's the simplest hardest thing to do for all of us, but it's the most beneficial thing that we can all do is to sit down and breathe and see what's going on in your mind and, um, you know, see what's going on in your body and your spirit and just to reflect and to really um, feel your entire being. Uh, it's it's be definitely beneficial, that's for sure. And uh, yeah, if, if it helps you out at your time of death, that's great, but it also helps you out in your time of life, you know, that's, that's what's important. And it helps us out to just be happier, you know, to be more at peace. Isn't that what we all want? It all starts within. Like, it's just true, man. The kingdom of heaven is within. It's, you know, a lot of other people say it. It's, it's within all of us to have this peace. And yet we run away from it. Isn't that ironic? It, we run away from our own sense of peace that it's hidden in plain sight the whole time. It's crazy. Gary, I'm curious, you've had, uh, you know, conversations with a really wide spectrum of practitioners and spiritual aspirants of various traditions. Um, I'm curious, you know, hearing our, the flavor that we're kind of speaking to and that of Buddhism, I'm curious if there's any kind of other threads that are bubbling up from these other conversations, either of resonance or contrast that you find kind of interesting. Um, you know, because I, I'm very curious about these other articulations, uh, both in terms of their differences and similarities. So is there anything, any figure or conversation that's kind of coming up in response to this one? Mm. Know. Or, you know, or out of those conversations, is there one that was the most interesting that you've um, had, you know, that's really sort of struck you and stuck with you? It's hard to say. I've had so many and touched on so many different points, but... It's all revolving around the same thing. And like I said, it's all within us and it's all up to us. It's not up to anybody else. Nobody else is going to do it for you. you. We all have to do it on our own accord in our own time to find this kingdom of heaven, to find this uh, eternal peace, and then to cultivate that within ourselves. You know, it's not a, it's not like all of a sudden you find it and then you're good. That's it. It's like, it's like an ongoing process. Um, I guess that's the only thing that I can say. Not there's nothing in particular, but like I said, it's all touching upon the same idea, and that's it's all up to us in our in our own circumstances and in our own individual um, pursuits to to cultivate that peace that's within all of us. It is. I fully believe that every single human being is capable of maybe not 
donning the robes and living the monastic life, but at least we can find some kind of semblance of peace that's there. It's always there. It's always there. We just have to find it first. And once you find it, once you find that, this is this is a thread that I think is common among many other people that I've spoken to is once you find that sense of peace that's been hidden in a facade of attachments our whole life, but once you find that, you never let it go. It's just something, you know, some it's, it depends on the what happened with people. Some people have had traumatic experiences. Some people have had psychedelic experiences. Some people have had 10 day Vipassana retreats, but whatever it is, once you get that taste of the peace, it's something that you just can't let go. It's just something, it's just like, whoa, that's what this life's all about. That's what, I'm, that's my purpose here. That's what I'm supposed to be kind of um, living for, I guess you could say. So yeah, nothing in particular, but it's that idea. It's that, it's that, that, enlightening aspect of just you know something dawning upon you and saying huh wait what about that what about that kind of way to live my life thank you that's that's really interesting the when you talk about yeah getting that that initial taste i mean it is really so important and uh yeah i'd love to go back and listen to some of your other interviews um and it it is really true i mean tanisimo and i've spoken about it but that initial that initial getting the sense of the the flavor of of freedom, but it really does kind of you need to go back and take another lick, you know, from time to time. You need to re reinvigorate your um, yeah why you originally got into it from time to time. I mean, initial inspiration we've got the taste, um, but that that fades. I mean, especially you see in a Thai tradition, you know, the attrition rate for Thailand at any time of the year might have 250 to 300,000 monks. And I don't know what the average number, you know, period of time that people ordained. Traditionally, you know, three months have been a common number, but you go over time, time versus the number of monks who ordain, and you're, you know, decreasing, um, I don't know about quite exponentially, but people disrobe because maybe they don't know how to get, you know, another uh, taste of what was initially inspiring. You mentioned earlier, just like a un, uh, unplugging. And I think that is something which a monastery or a, a practice community can really provide. I would imagine like many of your other guests or interviewees, almost certainly, you know, spend less time on the internet or surfing than the average American populace does. And that's really important. And for people coming into a monastery, you know, Buddhist monastery, uh, obviously, the Buddha didn't set any, he had lots of rules, but there are zero rules about internet use, uh, because the Buddha obviously didn't grow up in a time of internet. So, um, but yeah, people have to create their own rules, or within monasteries, uh, there'll be different policies. So, Abayagiri in California has a certain internet policy, and there, um, yeah, everybody gives up their own personal devices, and there are, you know, you have a period, maybe an hour twice a week to use the, the internet and largely doing emails. Um, but yeah, you're kind of forced, you're forced to go, it's not completely cold turkey, but you've really, your options, you've intentionally cut off your options. I mean, people can disrobe at any time and go back and, you know, go infinite uh, internet bandwidth, whatever. But um, yeah, it, it, it is, important and useful and amazing that there are these sanctuaries where uh, the internet isn't our God and we're not, you know, constantly tapped into that. And obviously there's nothing wrong as we're all, you know, experiencing and evidence of at the moment that there's amazingly beautiful and wonderful things about the, the internet. But when we don't know how to shut off and unplug, then that, it sucks. It sucks your energy and it, it just sucks. And you live a life which is substandard and you don't reach your own standards. And uh, you're not really necessarily going to be a, uh, a model of a paragon of um, inspiration for others, perhaps, perhaps necessarily. I mean, you might be an exception as what you're doing is, is really exposing people to all these alternative points of views. But for say Tan Nisibo and ourself, myself, you know, we we're starting a monastery. In, in Seattle. And though we do have our YouTube offerings, um, most of our days are not spent necessarily on the internet. And 
certainly at training monasteries, these are places where people can, um, yet the majority of people are not using the internet or are only using it for a very short period of time. And to, to take time and for people to, to make opportunities, whether you go to a monastery or not, Buddhist or otherwise, to make opportunities for yourself to, to unplug, it's exceedingly important to be able to get back, to get back initial flavors and tastes of why you're looking for something that's better and, and more subtle than uh, the flow of, of society. Mm -hmm. Amen. So could anybody just come, do you guys have the monastery right now? Nope. <laughs> oh, so it's in, in progress. <laughs> yeah, basically um, I'm in Seattle. Ajin Kovilo is uh, studying um, at a Buddhist university, uh, ancient languages and other uh, various subjects. And we'll be here in Seattle for part of the time. Um, the monastery project, which is sort of at this point, the aspiration of a monastery is called Clear Mountain. Um, so clearmountainmonastery.org is our website. Um, and that's kind of what the monastery is, is uh, I just moved to Seattle last spring and um, I'm in a little hut behind a lay person's house who offered the space for me. And Ajin Kovila will be here for part of the year um, as well when he's uh, able. And uh, we're just at this point focusing on building community. You know, as monastics, there's an ethic of you don't ask for, for things um, and, and really rely on generosity uh, in, in every aspect. So usually the process for a monastery or community beginning is you go somewhere and then you go alms round every day. Um, we can't store food, um, you know, or use money. So basically it was the Buddha's way, one way of keeping the monastic community from cutting themselves off in a spiritual cocoon and making sure we have direct contact with society regularly. So every morning um, I have to go into Seattle to go for alms. And if people give me food, then great. Um, if not, then they don't. And, um, uh, but basically between that daily interaction with the city and every Saturday we have sort of these meditation gatherings in town, um, you know, the community hopefully will build. And if there's interest and people offer a piece of land or, you know, funds to search out for something, then we'll be able to. Um, but we really have to have faith that you know, we, we reside in a sort of confidence in the goodness of humanity. And, and if there's interest for something like this, then eventually we'll hopefully have a place you can go. But for now it's a website and at varying points, Ajin Kovilo and I in huts. <laughs> so that's about it. Well, thank you guys for coming on. You seem like wonderful individuals as well. Keep doing your thing. Keep spreading the good word. Um, yeah, man. I um, appreciate you for coming on. This was an amazing talk. Thank you for anybody that listened. And yeah, other than that, hope all is well in the future with you. And uh, maybe yeah, someday we will meet. If not, this is this is this is the this is the world now. <laughs> We're virtually meeting. But yeah, thanks guys, and have a good day. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Gary.